Our next speaker is Dr. Robert Gish, who's going to tell us everything about viral hepatitis in 20 minutes. Um, so it's not fair to do make Bob do that. We we gave Bob this because we thought Delta uh, therapy was going to be approved in uh, shortly, and it's being delayed a little bit. But he's going to update us on what's new on in viral hepatitis from the liver meetings. Bob. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. I do want to give you a prelude to this, and that is I'm going to focus mostly on B, a little bit on Delta, because I really think the C world is um, pretty well covered, except for some of the obstructions that we see from insurance companies and states, et cetera. And globally, the hepatitis C story is about access and policy. So hepatitis C is not boring. It's more about action. But the hepatitis B world is unbelievably exciting. And um, there's not that much happening in the hepatitis A or E world. So I'll make a few comments about A and E as well, to, uh, but back to a big focus on uh, uh, B is in bad and D is in deadly. I'm very active both in the US and globally working on viral hepatitis elimination plan. I just got back from going around the world, working in Dubai, Pakistan, and Vietnam over the last couple of weeks. And my jet lag is doing pretty well. So if I stumble a little bit, I'll give you that prelude. Uh, when I was in Pakistan, we had a real nice uh, event of the Pakistani Society of Liver Disease. Uh, Nora Taro was there, Bilal Hamid from UCSF, and Homi Razavi, who's working with Polaris and this whole idea about uh, global hepatitis B elimination. And we're basically, in most countries, far, far behind. Hepatitis C, there's a few countries like Georgia, Egypt, um, that are really moving ahead. Even Mongolia is doing a good job but uh, some wonderful first world countries like the US are far behind. And again, it's really about a policy issue. There was a recent meeting at the White House on hepatitis C led by um, President Biden's team about a really a moonshot for viral hepatitis C and about $8 billion is being proposed. We're trying to piggyback B on that effort. Hopefully you've heard about that. Um, I do want to take a little bit of credit for that because I had dinner with Ham, um, Kamala Harris in uh, 2017 before really the, the run up for the election and spent an hour and a half with her talking about viral hepatitis and submitted a letter to her and President Biden right after they were elected. And that letter ended up moving through the system with backup from a number of advocacy organizations. So really hoping that this uh, elimination uh, targets is gonna get uh, a much better with better investment, both in the US and globally. And the US can, really lead the way about hepatitis B. Um, there is problems to hepatitis B elimination. We still don't have a cure for this like we have for hepatitis C. We have functional cure, uh, which is hepatitis B surface antigen loss, but getting to a real cure is a little ways out, but I'm gonna try to give you some uh, good news on that shortly. I want to lead into this presentation about B with uh, some ideas that I came up with recently and presented, uh, and this is available online called the Witty Lecture at the Hepatitis B Foundation about six weeks ago. But really the message now is to simplify the hepatitis B message. And I came up with this five line guideline, which seems to pass a lot of tests from different KOLs around the world. And this was derived from two conference calls we had with the Hepatitis B Foundation about six weeks ago with 40 KOLs from around the world. And believe it or not, 20, sorry, 39 out of 40 people basically said, this is where we need to go with our guidelines and our guidances. It's way too complicated. We have two people dying every minute from hepatitis B and that number of deaths per minute has not changed over 20 years. We have six different guidances or guidelines written in the US. We have a pausal easel. The guidelines, guidances have not moved the needle. We need to make this simple. You know the statement about test all adults for hepatitis B will be out from the CDC in probably about six weeks. So that will become standard of care from a CDC and policy perspective. Vaccinate already is a policy from the ACIP. You've already heard about that. But what's really gonna move the dial here is everybody who's surface antigen positive gets a DNA test 
and delta antibody. Of course, you have delta, they get linked to care. But we're talking about treating every patient who's DNA positive. Starting nuke therapy, nuke suppresses and decreases the risk of cancer by 70 to 80%. Decreases infectivity, decreases stigma, improves quality of life. These are all important issues, including taking transplant close to zero unless it's for liver cancer. And of course, you need to stage your patients for fibrosis. Now let's get into some of the data that's here. Uh, this is gonna be now a deep dive into ASLD. There's a lot of data here. I'm gonna really just give you concepts on each slide. There's about 55 slides in this deck. I shortened the number by about 50% to what I'm gonna show you, but the rest of the slides are available for you to look at later and to share broadly. And we're gonna talk now about this concept of integration. As you know, hepatitis B lives in CCC DNA and it integrates into the genome. Those integrants are truncated surface antigen messages and it makes X antigen from those integrants. So you can be thinking about this in a couple of ways. We're integrating over time. The more DNA that a patient has over time, the more integrants, the more chance of cancer. So let's treat early. And I think we're gonna be moving this dial to treating pediatric populations early, even though we need more data, of course. These integrants make surface antigen that could make you have a false idea that your drug has failed. You can get rid of DNA in the plasma, uh, the, the cytoplasm, you can get rid of CCTD DNA, but the integrants are still making surface antigen. So we're coming out with new assays to tell where surface antigen is coming from. Is it coming from an integrant or is it coming off the genomic or pregenomic RNA that's coming off CCC DNA? So a big advance that's gonna come here as well. Also, when you see S antigen loss in the presence of surface antibody, that doesn't mean there's no surface antigen. It just means it's bound up in an immune complex. Two things are happening here. We have new assays that are gonna go down one or two logs more. Our current assays go down to 0.05 IUs. We have two new assays from Abbott and Fuji Rebio that will go down one and two more logs to look for S antigen at a more sensitive level. And we can uh, break the antibody antigen complexes and find surface antigen. What this means clinically isn't clear, but I'm just describing to you better and better assays are coming for determining our level of our surface antigen clearance and where S antigen is coming from. So now we're gonna get into some exciting new information. And one of the main messages here is when you're talking to patients about treating with dukes, stop using the word forever. Stop using the term indefinite. Give patients hope. There are 16 targets we're looking at in hepatitis B for antiviral therapies. There's over 30 companies in this space, 30 to 40 new drugs that are being developed for hepatitis B. I'm an optimist, I'm from Kansas originally. I really think we are going to be at functional cure, moving from 5% to 40% within five years. Sterilizing or complete cure, maybe 10 years away, but this is no longer a forever on a nucleoside or nucleotide analog. So now I'm gonna get into some certain drugs. There's a lot of details here, but now I'm gonna talk about just some of the technology. So siRNA or interfering RNAs, these go into the cytoplasm, they bind to what's called the risk complex and break RNA messaging for clearing S antigen or X or core or pre-core or the polymerase. We can reduce with these siRNAs, S antigen production, DNA production, two to four logs, but they're not going to be successful on their own. But I do believe this will be a backbone of future therapies. Let's look a little bit more at some other clinical trial data. Oops, let me see if I can go back one. I think that went too fast forward. Can we go back one slide? There we go. So this is the J&J &J siRNA that was um, developed by Arrowhead. I was involved with Arrowhead's development of this drug about uh, 10 years ago. Also a capsid assembly modulator was part of this and nuke and interferon. So four drug combination. 
And this is what I've been advocating, thinking this is what it's going to get us to this S antigen loss rate and, and the 40% range. But this was a success and a failure story. They didn't get to any patients who got S antigen clearance. We got multi-log reduction, though, in S antigen, which is very, very useful. And also, when you take the patients off this combination therapy, there's typically is an S antigen reset that's down about two logs. There was hints from these reef studies that the CAM inhibited the IRNA. So this company really went out and said CAMs are a failure. We're not going to be working on CAMs or these capsid assembly modifier uh, therapies any further. But I really think it's too early to say CAMs are dead. And I'll talk a little bit more about CAMs in a few moments. But four drug combinations, what I think is going to take us to get to this uh, S loss rate. And this is just a partial story. Getting back to CAMS, uh, the Bicrevir is a drug that was, was being developed by assembly. This is a first generation CAM that blocked the capsid formation. Could either be a dysmorphic CAM or an empty CAM, but this would inhibit release, of course, of S antigen a little bit, but more importantly, the capsid uh, component proteins and very importantly, DNA. There was resistance to this if used as a single therapy. Um, about 10 to 20 percent that was probably clinically significant and all of these patients relapsed when they came off this drug so we're going to call this also a partial failure but in combination I still think that cams are having a success and I showed you something on the previous slide to support that so this is another concept here with an uh, interfering RNA this is a single trigger the Johnson and Johnson was at targeting at two different places in the messenger RNA. This siRNA from Veer was looked at in combination with pegylated interferon and showed marked reduction of S antigen. And there are other viral markers that decrease with this as well. So peg interferon is not gone. It's still being looked at. And I'll give you another story about that in a moment. Veer is also developing a monoclonal antibody, which I thought could be an immediate failure because when you give monoclonal antibodies to hepatitis B patients, the virus tends to mutate quickly. But this monoclonal antibody has a vaccine effect as well. It has a very powerful immune stimulating process. We're not sure exactly the mechanism of that. So you're giving an antibody to bind antigen that's going in as an immune complex into dendritic cells and mononuclear cells and also has an, a vaccine effect. So this looks like you're going to be giving an immune modulator also. There's a, another product from China, also the neutralizing antibody. And the good news with both of these products is there's been no S antigen mutants that have taken place. 20 years ago, we had a monoclonal antibody being developed in the US for transplant patients. And there was a problem of S mutants and resulted in fulminant liver failure from very aggressive uh, hepatitis B uh, mutants, but have not seen that with this. We are seeing binding, we're seeing S antigen reduction. So monoclonal antibodies will be very important. Concept on this slide is talking about immune response a 10-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a 60-year-old have very, very different immune responses. And I think throwing one drug or one drug combination at every age group is probably not appropriate. A patient who's 60-year-old has already gone through what's called T-cell exhaustion and even what's called clonal deletion. They may not have any T-cell activity that can be revitalized, and they may need a different therapy than a young person who's got very, very active T and B cell activities against hepatitis B. And ultimately, it will take immune control to clear the virus from the cytoplasm and clear CCC DNA. And every company I'm working with has a component of immune modulation in the plans for their drug development. This is looking at functional cure in a study in China. And this is a large study, um, prospective study, real world that took place. But they had patients on nukes, long-term nukes, low DNA, and very importantly, low surface antigen levels. And they got, with this combination therapy, nukes with um, add-on interferon, they got up to a 30% S loss rate. But this is a select population. This is not real world in terms of being able to apply to our general hepatitis B patients. And there's lots of failure studies out there combining nukes with interferon. So this is a best, best case scenario. And the message here, in my opinion, is check S antigen, 
quantitatively on all your patients annually and use that quant S to think about natural history, on treatment clearance, and maybe stopping nukes and off treatment clearance, and then maybe with immune modifiers. There's a number of slides in here about basic science. I hid most of those slides, but they are available for your review. But I just wanted to talk for just one moment about very special new tools. We're going down to a single cell level to talk about what's going on with the virus, what's going on with the virus, and potentially immune system signaling that's there as well, and profiling individual cells in hepatitis B. We may come back and be doing FNA on patients in clinical trials, and FNAs may eventually even guide how we manage patients in the clinic. FNAs are super simple. They're very safe, but they're not sampling a large number of cells yet. So if we can improve that technology, that may come uh, back to the clinic. You heard from Gina about vertical transmission. There's a lot of data on this slide, but the, really the take home message is, if you start TDF, TDF derivatives, at 16 weeks of pregnancy, I'm interpreting this to say we don't need HBIG. In many parts of the world, HBIG is very expensive. It's an out-of-pocket expense. Where I was in Vietnam for the last two weeks, a dose of HBIG at birth is $50 US. That's a large amount of money for a number of individuals who are living at uh, our concept of poverty. So if we can get rid of HBIG, these medications are very expensive, especially if you're using them for two, three, or four months. Getting rid of HBIG would be a major advance. Uh, this is just talking about expanding guidelines in these patients with low levels of hepatitis B viremia, less than 2,000. There's still an increased risk of HCC. Both modeling and some retrospective studies saying if you take that DNA down to undetectable, you further reduce that HCC risk by 30 to 40 percent. In patients with very high levels of virus, you're reducing HCC risk with viral suppression 70 to 80 percent. So this concept of linking all patients to treatment, I think the time has come. I'm hoping the next round of guidelines, which are being written, guidances by AASLD, will include these simple concepts. Uh, let's see, we've already talked about this. This is a little bit more about integration. So the virus is integrating into the host DNA. We have two really good studies with tenofovir. That when you reduce viral levels, you're also re reducing the number of active integrants, how many integrants are going into the DNA. You're reducing the activity of the integrants in terms of expressing um, uh, messenger RNA. And with endonucleases, you can reverse the number of integrants by suppressing the overall viral level. We have more and more information on why we should be treating all patients. We decrease integrants, we decrease HCC risk. Another hot topic, is stopping nuke treatment. We know from the Hepatitis B Foundation data that 40% of patients stop nukes on their own and don't even tell their providers. Other people stop because they run out of insurance, they're bored, they don't want you know, some risk of bone or renal disease, even though that's relatively low, even with TDF. And Tecavir and TAF are extremely safe, but people stop. Now, when you're having a discussion with your patients, you need to say, if you stop, you could have a flare and die. We know that that's clear from a number of studies, including the study in Taiwan. But if you have a quant S level that's very low, there's a very good chance that stopping will result in S clearance. And that could be as high as 30% in adult acquired hepatitis B, 5 to 15% in vertically acquired hepatitis B. So annual quant S testing is important. Quantitative S antigen has also been linked to HCC risk, to transmission risk in combination with DNA levels. Quant S, very, very useful test in managing your patients today. That's evidence-based. A uh, big controversy is how long do you con continue your nuke after someone gets rituximab? The current guidelines really vary from six to 12 months after the last dose of rituximab. This is saying somewhere between six and 12 months is probably uh, ideal. There are some predictors about uh, relapse or having a flare even after a year 
after stopping rituximab and then stopping your nuke. So be cautious in those patients, have continuous monitoring. This is, uh, ends up being a medical legal problem for uh, obviously some providers if they aren't looking at the guidelines and aren't monitoring their, their patients closely. This also talks about patients who clear S, they have surface antibody that's measurable. The surface antigen is present in these complexes, these antibody antigen complexes up to 13 years after S loss. So S loss is just a relative term right now until we can get to therapies that clear CCC DNA with this sterilizing or complete cure concept. S antigen is still around. Uh, this is HCC risk also in this indeterminate phase. I'm gonna move quickly through that. Getting close to the end here, um, this is neutralizing antibody plus siRNA in combination. And this really talks about how much we can reduce surface antigen load by combining an siRNA and a monoclonal antibody. Uh, this is now using an antibody in combination, excuse me, siRNA um, and uh, a, um, an interferon in these patients with chronic hepatitis B, getting more and more data about deep uh, viral antigen suppression and then potentially leading to a cure. Uh, a little bit more on the REEF study. This is what we talked about before where we didn't reach S antigen clearance in a significant number of patients but are having a viral reset. Um, I'm going to be wrapping things up with what I think is one of the most exciting drugs in this space. I'm going to call it BEPI for short. This is a ASO that was actually developed um, in uh, San Diego uh, by ISIS, which is now called IONIS. Um, and this was taken over um, by GSK and is now in development. This acts in a similar way to the siRNA by interfering with messenger RNA signaling. The original drug was actually bound to Galnac, which was a targeted uh, tool of delivering this ASO to the hepatocyte. Then they decided to also try a naked form, and the naked form without the Galnac, without targeting the liver, uh, actually led to a much higher rate of um, uh, response. There actually were immune-related flares that they profiled. And in this, with 24 weeks of this treatment, you can get now a 10% rate of S antigen loss that looks durable at least another uh, 24 weeks off therapy. So ASO therapy is now really moving out to be very exciting, very short-term treatment, 10% S loss. So it's really finite therapy with combination therapy that I think <clears throat> is um, the path forward. So I'm just gonna wrap things up here with a few comments about hepatitis C. This is talking about reinfection with hepatitis C after DAA treatment. This is a Canadian study showing that the incidence rate in long-term active uh, PWID individuals reinfection rate is very low. One of the reasons for this, even though there is ongoing exposure and risk events, is this whole issue about risk management and modifying those individuals' behavior with safe injection practices. This is obviously a big part of managing viral B and C worldwide. In Pakistan, where I was, B and Delta are dominant. And the reason that they're so dominant in Pakistan is because of medical injections with dirty needles. And they're changing that policy within their country. Uh, there's still issues about monitoring for HCC after hepatitis C cure. And really my threshold is to be monitoring people with F3 and F4 long-term, not just cirrhosis. And I use the triple biomarker panel that's made by uh, Fuji, uh, Fuji uh, Film that's uh, here at this meeting, AFPL3, DCP, and AFP, and using the GALAD score for deciding who's at risk and for surveillance. Finally, you heard from Paul that Delta treatment may be approved in the US shortly. It's already available um, in Europe in multiple countries under an early access uh, authorization. Uh, so we hopefully will have bulevertide here in this country soon. Viral control, normal ALT, the typical number I just described is about a 60% response rate. It is a daily injection. It's a long-term injection. And information on lonafarnib and a press release just came out a few days ago from Iger, also showing good data for an on-treatment response. The cascade of care with Delta, the big problem is lack of testing. So every surface antigen positive patient should be tested for Delta antibody antibody positive check for quant PCR.
their PCR positive linked to care, linked to close follow-up, and get them ready for these treatments. A little bit more about Bulevertide. We have the data on 72 weeks that's on this slide. I'm gonna wrap up with this five-line guideline just to remind you how simple it can be to get to hepatitis B elimination, at least control, while we're waiting for some of these new drugs. There's a little bit of data on hepatitis A titers um, in asymptomatic plasma donors. There may be some uh, hepatitis A transmission uh, from blood units. So chronic viral hepatitis is a huge global problem, a big problem in the US, leading to high rates of morbidity, mortality, stigma, quality of life. We need to intervene with a test and treat, a test and treat, very simple model. Don't forget about Delta. We have new treatments coming, 70% mortality rate. The test cost is just a few dollars. Let's figure out who has Delta in our community as well. Hepatitis A is a vaccine preventable disease. Thank you very much for having me. I love this meeting and faithfully follow this and get ready for the panel. Thank you.